Hi everyone, I hope you're doing well. Um, I'm going to be your moderator. I'm going to be your host for this session and um, we're going to be having Nathan Robinson with us today. Um, so thank you so much, Nathan, for speaking. Um, right, so Dr. Nathan Robinson is a marine biologist and science communicator with a master's in marine biology from the University of Southampton and a PhD from Purdue University, Indiana. He is best known for several viral internet videos that have shown the world the effect of humanity on our oceans. His video of him removing a plastic straw from the nose of a sea turtle has amassed millions of views and is considered to be one of the inspirations behind the movement of, against single-use plastic. He is also well known for his footage of a giant squid, only the second time that this species has been filmed alive. His research has also included the Turtle Cam project, which helped advance our understanding of sea turtle behavior through animal-born and deep-sea cameras, as well as drones. I'm going to be passing it over to um, Dr. Robinson. Thank you so much. Hello. I believe everyone can see me and, and hear me. Uh, <laughs> I've never used Discord before, um, so I've had a like a 60 second rundown to how this all works. So um, hopefully, hopefully it will go smoothly. But thank you for the wonderful introduction, uh, Celestine, and I'm super excited to be here. Uh, and I'm yeah proud to have the opportunity to talk to everyone today. The uh, the theme of the conference was a timeline in science. And so I thought from my talk, the best way to do that would be to give you a rundown of my timeline in ocean conservation and science. So this is going to be a quick rundown of the journeys and adventures that I've had uh, over my past say, 15 years as a, a marine biologist. Um, so if we could move on to the next slide. Wonderful. So yeah, I'm a, I'm a marine biologist and I'm a, a very lucky marine biologist in, in that because I've been able to, uh, through my career, I've been able to travel to some of the most kind of remote and unseen parts of the, the globe. I've worked on tropical beaches with nesting sea turtles in areas where you might not see another person for days at end and there's more, um, yeah, there's more turtles on the beach at night than people to socialize with. I'm also one of those few lucky people who's been able to take a submarine to the bottom of the ocean. And last year, I traveled to the bottom of the Exuma Sound in the Caribbean Sea <laughs> in the submarine that you can see in the top right hand corner. And then on top of that, last year, well, at the turn of last year, I was nominated by Ocean X, which is kind of like the marine equivalent of SpaceX and what SpaceX do for space exploration, Ocean X are really doing for deep sea exploration. And they nominated me as responsible for two of the most important marine biology stories of the decade. So what I wanted to talk to you about today is how I ended up getting here. So if we move forward a slide. Okay, so I just found out a second ago that these videos might be going on YouTube later, so I might regret having this photo in here. But I didn't always start off as a, a, as a marine biologist traveling to the ocean. <laughs> this is a photo of me very bored during my master's thesis, practicing how many buckets I could fit to myself. And I guess anyone can have a, a reward for figuring out which end of me is which <laughs> in the photo. Um, and this is another photo of me when I started off as a, I actually started off doing marine biology working with crabs before I started moving on to uh, the other species that I'll talk to about, talk to you about in the rest of the presentation. Now, for me, it all began in London. That's where I was born and raised. And I was always obsessed with the ocean. I always loved wildlife and, I was particularly obsessed with large wildlife, and that's one of the reasons that really drew to marine biology, because most of the biggest animals on the planet, including the biggest animal that's ever lived on our planet, the blue whale, lives in the ocean. 
So I went to the University of Southampton and I studied for, um, yeah, I studied to complete a marine biology degree. And it was fantastic. I learned a lot. And I don't want to discredit this because it was an incredible experience, but it wasn't what I expected. When I went to university, I had this somewhat naive dream that I was going to sign up for this marine biology course and within four or five months I was going to be uh, rubbing shoulders with David Attenborough and saving all these endangered species that I've been watching in documentaries for the better part of my life and it wasn't. It was very lab based, uh, very kind of book based and that really let me wanting. So as soon as I could I started volunteering and I started volunteering for an organization called Archelon. Archelon is the Sea Turtle Protection Society of Greece. And the photos you can see down in the corner is uh, a couple of photos from my first season out there and I loved it. It was living in a remote part of Greece. It was very kind of basic. We we're building our own uh, we're building our own structure to live in. We were working on the beach, uh, protecting sea turtles every day. It was really on the forefront of conservation. And that went from a volunteer position, turned into a job. And I worked in Greece for several years. That turned into another internship where I went to Costa Rica. And then that through Working in Costa Rica, I met the person who has eventually been my PhD supervisor, Frank Palladino. Uh, I completed my PhD through Purdue University in the US in collaboration with Nelson Mandela Metropolitan University in South Africa. And then uh, after I completed my research, I was offered a job as the research director of the Leatherback Trust. And that was a very, it felt like a very, it was a very proud moment in my life because I finally felt like I transitioned from dreaming about being, being a marine biologist. And all of a sudden I was a published marine biologist. This is, my life was opening up ahead of me and this is what I was doing. It was, it was a wonderful experience. And that is also the point at which my story starts to take a bit of a twist. And it was August 2015. I was living and working in Costa Rica at the time. And I had been invited on a research expedition with Texas A&M University. And the goal of the research expedition was to head out and sample Olive Ridley sea turtles, a species of sea turtle. And we were doing that on the Pacific coast of Costa Rica. Now I came on that expedition specifically because I was interested in epibionts. Epibionts are animals that live on other animals. A great example would be the barnacles you can see kind of crusted on that sea turtle's head in this image. And to find these epibionts, sometimes they're obvious, but often they're tucked away in the nooks and crannies of these animals. So every time a turtle was brought on the boat, I would scour over it, looking for all the different animals I could find. But when I was looking, on uh, one particular individual, I found something that I really wasn't expecting. And on my next slide, I think there's a video. So if we could play that video. I'm not sure if this is just dead space or if this is it's perfect. <laughs> Technology works. So lo lots of people have seen this video already, and it's, it's very difficult to watch. But what we found wasn't an animal. I actually first thought it was a tube worm. Sometimes you get these worms that live in these little shells, and they crust onto the shells of sea turtles. and um, we can move on to the next slide. Um, but when we started to investigate, it wasn't a, an animal whatsoever. It was a, a plastic straw. And that in itself 
was a, a shocking event. But two months later, a very similar thing happened. Once again, I was working with a lot of really seed turtles. I was still living in Costa Rica. But this time I was on uh, a different beach, about 30 to 50 kilometers away from that uh, previous sighting. And we encountered something very similar. So if I move to the next slide, this is uh, another video. Now, what we found this time around is once again, another plastic item wedged inside the nostril of a sea turtle. But when we investigated and pulled it out, we discovered it was actually a plastic fork, a plastic fork that had been wedged into the sea turtle with the tines, the head of the fork actually uh, inside uh, with only the handle sticking out. Now, those two instances help to highlight the threat posed by plastic pollution to sea turtles, especially in the waters of Costa Rica and Central America. And from a scientific perspective, it was quite interesting. No one had ever recorded plastic items being wedged in sea turtles' noses before. And all of a sudden, within a period of two or three months, we found two instances of this. And what we actually think is happening is these animals who are swallowing these plastic items and then trying to regurgitate them. And then when they regurgitate them, they're not passing straight through the throat, they're actually passing into the nostrils, into the kind of inner nostrils. And that's why the item is getting stuck. Now, this is perfectly clear with the fork, because you can see that the head of the fork is inside. There's no way the fork could have pushed its whole way through the nostril without causing a huge amount of damage to the outside of that animal, which wasn't there. So it's got to be coming out the other direction. So we wrote up both of those instances into two small peer-reviewed scientific articles that were published in the Marine Turtle Newsletter. And I looked at one of them maybe, uh, I don't know, two or three months ago now, probably even a little bit longer than that. But I looked at them a while ago, and I was checking online how often that article had been read. And from a very typical uh, kind of scientific publication uh, aggregator called ResearchGate, it showed that that publication had been read 1,500 and something times. You can see by the little red arrow, which is okay. That's not that's not a huge impact. But as I'm, as many of you probably know, and part of the reason why I'm talking to you today is. That's not where the biggest impact of these videos occurred. The biggest impact of these videos was social media online. Those posts, when they're initially shared, were shared collectively over 60,000 times. There was a short period of time when I think uh, the initial post I made was competing with one of the Kardashians for the most shared post of um, 2015. <laughs> Those videos combined, once again, have now been viewed over 100 million times on YouTube. So that's, um, I, I'm based in Spain right now, and that's over twice the population of Spain. So this is everyone, uh, children, to, uh, pensioners, have viewed that video to two to three times in this entire country. And that's just YouTube. That doesn't include any other platforms. And that story was also picked up by every, well, pretty much every single major news source in the world, National Geographic, Huffington Post, Daily Telegraph, New York Times, Al Jazeera, El País, The, the Guardian, uh, and countless more. It helped to inspire several anti-plastic and specifically anti-straw campaigns, like we, strip, we Skip the Straw, No Straw Please, and The Last Straw movements. It even inspired a, a feature length documentary on the problems caused by straws, inventively called straws. And this was the first reason that I was nominated by Ocean X um, for one of the most important marine biology stories of the decade. Now, what did I learn from that? Well, it was pretty clear that a single image 
can start to change the world. And almost overnight, images like uh, this kind of up in the top right corner uh, stop being stop happening. Like people started being conscious about the impact that straws are having on the world, and it became difficult to go to a bar anymore or to go get a drink without <clears throat> and see plastic straws in lots of parts of the world. Companies as big as Starbucks and things like that started to place bans or provide alternatives. And knowing that a single image or a single video can change the world. And as a marine biologist, as a conservationist, my goal is to try to make the oceans <clears throat> and the world a better place. How can I start to use this knowledge to help fight this good ecological fight? And I decided that moving forward, I was going to start incorporating ana uh, sorry, camera technologies into my research. And the idea behind that was by using, actually incorporating cameras into the research themselves, then I can not only go around and answer some important ecological questions with the footage that I'm able to record from these camera systems, but if I get footage that can help engage the public in some of the problems that our planet and our oceans are facing, then I can use this as a platform to hopefully promote even more change. And what I wanna to talk to you about today are three specific areas that I've been focusing on where I've been trying to incorporate cameras into my research. <clears throat> and I wanna to talk to you about some of the successes that we have had. <clears throat> so the three projects I'm gonna to talk to you about are, <clears throat> excuse me, are the use of drones, the use of cameras that actually deployed onto the animals themselves, so animal-born cameras, and finally, talking about cameras that we're deploying into the deep sea. Now drones, drones are a wonderful up and coming technology that have really started to change a lot of the ways we, uh, a lot of the ways field biologists that we do research. They've opened up a brand new a perspective for us to look at wildlife. If we want to get an aerial viewpoint, we no longer have to find a small flying aircraft or something similar. You can get these off the shelf commercial drones that can fly flexible paths. They're, depending on the unit you go with, they can be relatively quiet, they can be relatively inexpensive. And they've provided an incredible way for us to start getting new insights into the behavior of marine animals. In particular, you think marine animals are often rather difficult to study because they're, it's hard to see them directly. If you're in a boat, it's difficult to spot them unless they come to the surface. But if you take that aerial perspective, you get some fantastic insights into what they're up to. So I've now been using drones in a big variety of research projects focusing on whales, to dolphins, to sea turtles, and my favorite has actually been to investigate the movement patterns of crocodiles. And what I would love to show to you now is just some of my favorite clips from, our, from several of our drone projects. So I have another quick video to play, if you would be so kind. I think Harry's doing all the, the video stuff and you're doing a great job. <laughs> okay, so this is, this is a whale filmed off the coast of Costa Rica. And if you'll see, there's actually a baby humpback whale comes up right next to it uh, a second later. This is myself and one of my best friends, Janelle, doing some research on crocodiles in Costa Rica again, but this was actually fantastic. This was a crocodile we recorded swimming out in the open ocean. They're using, they don't just live in these estuaries, they're actually crossing open oceans to get from estuary to estuary. This was the first ever drone footage anyone recorded of uh, a leatherback turtle. Uh, once again, we recorded this in Costa Rica. And then this is just a final clip of a uh, a research project that I used to work on um, where we used to monitor for sea turtles at night and just give you an idea of the kind of spectacle you can record when you're working with drones. Okay, so the next 
system I'm going to talk about is when we've actually been deploying cameras onto the animals that we're interested in studying. And unlike drones that give us this aerial perspective, all of a sudden, this now gives us a first person perspective of how an animal sees the world around it. So this is fantastic. We can start to get insights into behaviors that we might not normally see. Because for example, if we're snorkeling alongside a sea turtle or a shark or something like this, they might not behave the same way if we weren't there. So we can get to these, these we call them like, like cryptic behaviors, behaviors that are very difficult to understand. And my favorite project of our, our turtle cam, or the, my favorite project of our animal born cameras so far has been the turtle cam, which is where we've been using, uh, yes, these cameras to study the behaviors. And we've mainly been studying the behaviors of juvenile sea turtles. And one of the things I love so much about this project is we've uncovered some really cool new behaviors from these, these animals. Previously, everyone used to think of, or most people used to think of sea turtles as largely being solitary animals. They don't, as far as we know, they don't really talk. They're not communicating with one another. They just kind of do their stuff and live their lives. But what we start to discover with these turtle cams is that the vast majority of these animals, if they see another turtle swim past them, they immediately go up and interact. Now, sometimes it might be a territorial display. One turtle might be chasing off another turtle. It's probably something to do with resources. There's food in this area or shelter in this area. There doesn't want another turtle to take, so it's willing to fight them off. But other times, it's a, a positive interaction. We've got videos of two sea turtles coming up and like, rubbing heads gently or they might just sit next to each other with one have like the flipper on the other shell and the purpose behind these interactions we really don't understand now some people have suggested it could have something to do with mating but all the turtles that we've actually studied and the only turtles that are in the habitats where we were initially conducting this turtle cam project are juveniles so they're not uh, sexually active they're not reproducing um, so why they have this kind of in a very anthropomorphic, like friendly interactions with each other. Um, we're still trying to figure that out now. So I'd like to move on to my next slide again. And we have a couple of other, well, a couple of videos from this telecam project that I'd love to share with you. Now the first video, or well, the first clip is going to show you just how pristine these these habitats are the waters are so incredibly clear in the bahamas it's an absolute privilege to uh, to swim with them and to see this footage uh his quick turtle of, uh, quick video of a couple of turtles coming to check each other out one was feeding and the other one kind of uh, disturbed him we have interactions between different animals that was a, a caribbean whiptail stingray And the, the frame rate might not be good enough to see this, but if you can, this is one of my favorite clips. This is, I think we call it turtle slap. That's one turtle <laughs> cruising in front of the other one. And I don't think it has a very good concept of its own personal space, but it gives the other one a bit of a knock on the head as it swims past. It's, it's nice to see some of these cute laugh out loud moments. Um, there we go. Yeah, it's nice to see some of these cute laugh out loud moments uh, when we're reviewing the footage. So far, those first two projects, drones and animal-born cameras, have focused largely on animals that are relatively, say, relatively easy to spot, animals that we can see relatively uh, predictably. If we want to study sea turtles, we know to go into sea turtle habitats. If we want to study crocodiles, we go into crocodile habitats. But the last... Um, Yes, the last project that I'd love to talk to you about is the work that I've been doing in the, the deep sea. Now, the deep sea is a, a tricky habitat to explore for several reasons. Um, but what most people don't really understand is that it is arguably one of the most important habitats on this planet, and it is definitely the largest habitat 
that we have. About 70% of our planet is water. And then about another 70% of that is over a mile deep. So about kind of somewhere around 40 to 50 percent of the world is deep water habitat. It really is the biggest, um, really the biggest habitat on this planet that probably has some of the highest levels of biodiversity. But as I'm sure many of you have uh, heard or read before, we currently know less about the bottom of the ocean than we do about the surface of the moon. And that's very true. But how do we explore the bottom of the ocean? Well, one of the most conventional ways of doing this is using submarines or remotely operated vehicles, ROVs. Now, these are either, these are kind of deep sea going vessels with either have people inside or don't have people inside and controlled by a little remote control from, um, from a boat above. And the idea is you head down, you use your little thrusters, and you go around and explore and you see what you find. Fantastic, incredible devices that have uncovered some uh, amazing knowledge about the bottom of the ocean. But there's a couple of limitations behind them. And one of the big ones is when you go down below around 200 meters in some parts of the ocean and 500 meters in other parts of the ocean, there's no light anymore. The light from the surface doesn't penetrate that far. It's perpetual darkness. It's perpetual nighttime. So if we want to see anything, we need to bring the lights with us. So generally what we do is on the front of these submarines, we put big white lights to light, to kind of, yeah, to light up everything around us so we can see what's in front of us. Uh, in addition, we need to have some way of moving so we have, as I mentioned, those big thrusters or propellers or some active propulsion unit to steer and move ourselves around when we're down there. The downside behind those two things is some of the animals in the, well, the animals in the deep sea, specifically because there is no light, are incredibly sensitive to light. For us, it might look like pitch black, but for them, they can see the slightest bits of light that are able to penetrate that far. They can also sense bioluminescence. So that is the light that animals produce. Something about one third of animals in the deep sea actually produce their own light. And the way that animals see each other and communicate with each other is sometimes by these flashes of light, but they're tiny, minuscule little specks. You've got to have incredibly uh, acute eyesight to be able to see these things. And if you, spend your whole life living in pitch black just picking up on these tiny little flashes of light all of a sudden sort of two big kind of car lights uh in the middle of your your habitat you'd be scared you wouldn't go in to check it out you'd probably see that from a distance and say mm, nah i'm not interested i'm going to go back into the inky depths where i where i've spent the vast majority of my life similarly the sound a lot of these deep sea animals can hear very well or at least hear vibrations so if you're churning up a lot of water to move your vessel through the sound you're producing could also be scaring away a lot of life so with that knowledge an incredible an absolute inspirational deep sea scientist edie widder who you can see standing uh, next to me in the bottom right hand image came up with the idea of a stealth camera the stealth camera is called the medusa and it's that yellow lidded box that you can see in all the images now the idea behind the medusa was it didn't produce white lights in fact it produced very very dim red light and what's good about red light is most animals in the deep sea can't see the color red so all of a sudden you can actually produce a little bit of light but it doesn't affect the animals around you the second key to this unit was it has no moving parts. It's literally a camera on a string. So there's no sound. So there's animals can probably can't hear this thing or see this thing. And there was another bit of technology that I'll show you in just a second that Dr. Widder invented for this camera, which is called the e-jelly, the electronic jelly. And the concept behind this was if you're going to drop a camera into the bottom of the ocean, you want to attract life to you. 
Now, the conventional way that we attract animals to us is by providing some kind of incentive, some kind of bait, right? So if you wanted to, if you want to study sharks in the deep sea or you want to study sharks in the surface waters, you'll chop up some dead fish uh, and put it in a little box and that's what will bring all this life around to check it out so you can film them on your camera. But Edie's thought was, well, in the deep sea, what about all those animals that are using light to hunt? What about all those animals that are looking for bioluminescence? And that's what they're hunting for. They're not scavengers, they're active hunters. How do we see them? Well, let's start producing our own light. She came up with this little device, the e-jelly, that simulates the bioluminescent display of a deep sea jellyfish. And this bioluminescent display actually signifies what we think is an, a burglar alarm. Essentially, the idea is when something comes along and starts eating this jellyfish, this jellyfish starts making, it's like a pinwheel blue light uh, bioluminescent display. And generally what happens is that light is so bright that it actually scares away whatever's eating the, uh, whatever is eating the jellyfish, probably because all of a sudden this animal is now lit up. So if there's anything bigger out there, this animal's thinking, I don't want to be lit up by this jellyfish's lies, I need to get out of here. That's why we call it a burglar alarm, because it's basically saying, I'm being eaten and raising, uh, someone's eating me and raising uh, awareness about this to all the other animals. Now, Edie and I started collaborating a couple of years ago and she'd heard about a lot of the work that I've been doing to promote or to connect science and science communication. She loves some turtle cam stuff. She's seen my straw video. She loves all that stuff. And fortuitously, we end up in the same place and we decided to collaborate. We decided to use this camera on, well, for this collaboration, we decided to use this camera in the waters of the Gulf of Mexico. And what we found was something beyond our wildest dreams. What we found was a species that has only been filmed before once in the wild, but it's a species that everyone knows the name of. It's a species that's so well known that it's mentioned in Greek mythology, in Norse mythology. Now, they t tend to refer to it as the Kraken, and we refer to it as the giant squid. So the next video that I'm about to show you is the footage that we recorded last year in the Gulf of Mexico. And this is the second time that the species has ever been caught alive on camera in its natural habitat. What you're going to see at the bottom of the screen is that e-jelly. So you'll see a little rotating pinwheel. That's the bait. And then you'll see the squid loom out of the darkness. So there's that little pinwheel up front. And there you go. This is the Kraken in all its glory. <laughs> I love, I can, I can literally watch that video all day. I, I, it still gives me little, uh, little films of electricity when I, the hairs on my back of my neck when I watch it. Now, that animal that we see there, we, actually only estimate that it's about four meters long. The reason we're able to, the reason we're able to estimate its size is because we know the size of the e-jelly, right? The e-jelly is kind of this wide, this long, and by relating the size of the tentacles to <clears throat> the size of the e-jelly and looking at the perspective, we were able to say it's around four meters, which would make it around, I guess, around 12 foot in length, which makes it just a baby. Giant squid are estimated to grow up to around 14 meters. So that'd be 42 feet. And then, so there's much, much bigger squid out there for us still to record. But I'm sure we'll all agree that four meters alone is still a pretty big animal. That, seeing that species was a dream come true for me. As a, as a kid being obsessed with the ocean, 
I'd read so many books about giant squid. I'd watched movies with giant squid. I was obsessed with the idea. And it really sem- seemed like the kind of the, the last sea monster to be discovered. And to actually be part of that discovery is something that I think about <clears throat> every day uh, with a huge smile on my face. And luckily, this story got picked up by uh, the New York Times, who made it front page, was competing with, I think, well, I'm sure Trump did something that day. Um, and it got picked up by another 400 news stories worldwide. On top of that, it was, that was my second nomination uh, from Ocean X, for the most important marine biology story of the decade. And one of the reasons I like the, the giant squid story so much, not just because I think it's cool, but because it's a species that we all, if I told you that the giant squid was going to go extinct, um, I think people are going to start, people would care. Often when you talk about species going extinct, you'll sometimes have that kind of pith response from some people of, well, why do we care? Why do we care if we lose the species of rhino? Why do we care if we lose the species of, um, uh, of turtle? And sometimes you can respond to that by providing an argument, or you can nearly always respond to that by providing an argument about the importance of ecosystems and the importance of um, complete, diverse ecosystems to support the rainforest that produce the oxygen that we breathe for to, to create those marine habitats that provide food that we eat. Sometimes that seems a little diffuse for people and people think, well, why do we really need diverse oceans? Can't we just have oceans packed with tuna, what we eat, and that's about it. And what I like about the giant squid is it's so culturally important. People have been fascinated by this for years. Fascinated to the point that it's, yeah, it's an ancient mythology. It's part of movies. Everyone knows the name of the giant squid. Everyone knows the name of the kraken. Now, what's amazing about these species is this species is culturally important, but we know so little about it. We don't know how many giant squid there are out in the ocean. We don't know whether populations are increasing, whether they're decreasing, what the threats to these animals are. Maybe climate change, which is definitely affecting the deep sea, and or ocean acidification, which is also affecting the deep sea, is having a huge impact on these animals. And they could be drifting into extinction as we speak with us not even knowing. We don't have the data to be able to tell you what the threats are yet. And that alone for me is such an important reason for us to start investigating and exploring more of the deep sea and i think that's an idea that resonates with a lot of people so that's one of the reasons why that giant squid story is so so dear to my heart okay so i just told you uh, a brief history of my background as a researcher. And my goal through all this was to try to engage global audiences. I find the marine habitats fascinating. And I think that the ocean and all life on this planet deserve protecting just because it is, because it's beautiful, because it provides inspiration. I, those reasons alone, I think the oceans are worth protecting not only the ecosystem services they provide to us, clean air, clean water, food, all these things. And one of my goals, and I think the best way to get people to think along that same lines, is to get people to fall in love with our oceans. And one of the best ways to do this, because not everyone can jump on a boat and go into the Gulf of Mexico or swim with sea turtles in the Bahamas or any of those, those stories, is to try to bring those stories to people wherever they are through the medium, uh, through the through social media, the medium of social media. And um, I would like to say that I've been relatively successful in, in my goal. I think the stories, and the press coverage that we've been able to achieve show that people are caring and we're starting to make a difference. And straws are uh, a great example of how we've actually been able to put plastic straws on the global discussion. You move back 10 years 
no one was talking about not using straws uh, because of the impact in the ocean. You fast forward to 2020 and everyone knows why you shouldn't use straws. We're starting to make that difference to make the world a better place. So I feel like in my mission from a bucket wearing young master student to a, a real marine biologist, as I call myself earlier today, I've, I've been relatively successful. But I do have to turn around and say, a global movement, the real changes require global credits and global efforts. Me sharing these videos only makes a difference if people start to engage and then make the necessary changes to make our oceans a better place. And for that, the, all the thanks needs to go to all those people who now say, no straw, please. All those people who don't use plastic bags in the supermarkets, they now you bring their reusable bags. All those people who remember to turn the lights off when they leave the house. Those are the people that deserve all the credit for making this world a better place. And I have to say that. The people who are listening, the thanks goes out to people like you and also you're helping sharing these stories that's what made the stories go viral it was people sharing it's not just me it was everyone so those are the impacts that you can have and if i come back to the straw story what i find amazing is i have now taken this idea of incorporating cameras into my research into new levels we have cameras on drones in the air, cameras at the bottom of the sea, cameras on sea turtles. But the first image was simply, or the first video that really got people excited was a point and click camera filming that straw being removed from a sea turtle. And ooh, sorry, was the straw being removed from a sea turtle? And as I said, it was a point and click camera. That was worse technology than most people have on their phones today. So what all this technological innovation has done around the world with smartphone technologies, camera technologies, the way I see it is it has put the power to change the world in your pocket. The stories that you tell with the cameras and the, the cameras that you have and the videos that you're able to collect have the potential to change the world around you. And knowing that, my question turns around to all you young scientists listening to this talk today and listening to this talk in the future, which is knowing that, what are you going to do with that power? That is the end of my talk. I have to give a huge thank you to all the different organizations that took part and supported each one of those projects that I mentioned. Nothing that I've spoken about today could have been done by myself alone. It requires a huge network of committed volunteers, students, organizations, entrepreneurs to collaborate on each one of these initiatives to make them a huge success. So a huge round of applause to all of my affiliations and all the supporting organizations, this and many more. And uh, I'd love to now turn around to you and say thank you so much for your patience with me struggling my way through Discord, listening to my talk. If you want to follow any more of my research, please check out Wild Blue Science at Instagram. Uh, or if you want to contact me directly, you have my email on the presentation. I'm always happy to talk more about science and excited to talk to other inspired uh, leaders of tomorrow. So thank you so much. Um, and uh, I hope you have a great day. Thank you, Dr. Robinson, for speaking for us. And, you know, I think your work takes a new meaning to the idea of a picture a picture can convey a thousand words. I actually remember the day exactly that I saw that video of the straw. You know, I was on Instagram looking through it. And then in the next few weeks, next few months, I saw kind of this movement within teenagers. I'm sure like many of us are aware, um, there's suddenly a bunch of people using, you know, reusable straws, plastic straws, no more plastic straws, mm -hmm. instead using paper straws everywhere. And it's really inspiring to see how your work 
can evoke such an important global movement. Um, Thank now, you. yeah, let's let's move on to questions. So um, anyone with any questions can send them over to YSJ Harry. Um, I actually got a question earlier, so let's start with that. Um, so Nicole asks, what is the greatest challenge of being a marine biologist? The biggest challenge of being a marine biologist? That's a fantastic question. Um, I would probably say the biggest challenge, the biggest personal challenge of being, let's, uh, let, let, uh, let, uh, let me ask, answer this in two ways. The biggest challenge of being a marine biologist in a professional sense is I honestly think being on the front line of seeing the impact we're having on our oceans. It's, it's, I honestly think it's very tough for a lot of people to see, to be working on sea turtle nesting beaches and the numbers of sea turtles decline every single year, to work with shark populations when you can be seeing thousands, hundreds of sharks being caught in long line nets to work with um, seabirds and on a daily basis you might be pulling or finding bodies of seabirds with plastic lining their stomachs that i say is one of the hardest things about being a marine biologist professionally speaking but personally speaking a, a tough challenge that i've had to experience being a marine biologist is your work inevitably takes you to some of the most incredible parts of the globe. You get to be one of the few people who get to say travel in a submarine or go to these remote beaches or you might be one of the few people who's actually got to see what it's like in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean but because you're always traveling and always in remote or isolated places, places where nature's at its most wild, you spend a lot of your time away from family and friends. So it ends up being a, a tough personal decision for a lot of people to make is, can you make that balance between, um, can you meet that balance between the exploration, the excitement of your work, uh, but the distance you might potentially have between like physical distance, of course, not emotional distance, physical distance you might have between you and your loved ones. Um, I would say that, at least for me, has been the biggest personal challenge of being a marine biologist. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, we have another question from Stella, who wonders whether the turtles get avoided by their fellow turtles because they are equipped with animal-borne cameras. Oh, that's a, that's a great question. And some people have, I've had a, several people suggest to me that maybe the turtles are interacting differently with each other because of the animal-borne cameras. But what we see from the animal-borne cameras is we can see it from both perspectives, right? So. Sometimes we see the turtle with an animal born camera swim up to another turtle that doesn't have an animal born camera and they might just possibly interact, might nuzzle, like rub heads, and might go the other way. Sometimes they might attack. Sometimes it might be the, an animal approaching a turtle with an animal born camera and nuzzling heads. And from our data, we have no evidence that the turtles are interacting in any way differently with these animals. Um, Sorry, um, these animals might be interacting any differently with the animals with turtle cams. Um, we also have been able to corroborate that by collecting drone footage as well. And we see some of the exact same behaviors when these animals are on drone. Uh, sorry, when we're calling these animals by drone as we do with the turtle cam. Um, right, yeah, thank you so much. So because of time constraints, I think we're gonna have to end the Q&A there, unfortunately. Um, but thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to speak for us. And um, to everyone else, I hope that you enjoyed that talk as much as I certainly did. Oh. Um, so we can head over to the Discord now to discuss and just to chat. And we'll have our next talks in approximately 11 minutes. Thank you so much, everyone. It was an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much, guys.